Hey everybody, this is going to be introduction to assignment 9, which will be our digital diagramming assignment. Um, so like many of the things we've done so far this semester, um, this is going to be tied in with Studio, although in this case it's going to be more directly tied in, where uh, the assignment you're producing in skills may end up being the same thing you turn in for Studio. Uh, that will depend on your Studio faculty and how they're intending to run that course, uh, but it's something you'll want to discuss with your Studio faculty um, so in general, what we're going to be doing is a, a series of generative diagram studies uh, based on uh, the public restroom project that you just completed, uh, where we're going to take the models from that that were constructed in Rhino, uh, export them uh, as vector line work through a make 2D command in Rhino, and bring them into Illustrator, where we can make a variety of diagrams using them um, as a basis. Um, again, talk with your studio faculty as to whether or not this will be the same thing that they want you to do in studio, or if they're going to have you do something separate. Uh, regardless, for skills, I would like you guys to do this same process. So again, uh, create an isometric view in Rhino, uh, export that and bring it into Illustrator, um, and use that to create a series of diagrams. Uh, for skills, we're not going to be particularly concerned about the analytical content of your diagrams. Um, I'm mostly concerned with the uh, exploration, the competency, and the graphic quality. So trying things is really what I want you guys to do. So use Illustrator uh, to do what Illustrator does best, uh, line work, patterns, gradients, um, any of the sort of graphical design things that uh, Illustrator is uh, particularly good at. Um, so I'll go over uh, the process of getting line work from Rhino into Illustrator uh, in my demo that will follow. Uh, the diagrams you create, you can do full color or black and white. It's totally up to you. General rule of thumb, it's easier to balance when you have less colors, uh, but it's up to you how you want to do that. Um, line weights are something you'll want to pay attention to. Uh, so when exporting uh, an axon image or an isometric image, you just want to make sure that um, you can control the line weights. So it's not something we actually have to do in Rhino in this case. Uh, we're going to be relying more heavily on Illustrator for a more uh, graphic quality that we're looking for. Um, it will be very helpful to use good layer management, both in Illustrator, Photoshop, and Rhino. Um, for the diagrams, uh, you're not limited to only using Illustrator. If you want to start in Illustrator and then eventually progress into using Photoshop, that is totally fine and optional and a part of a normal process that you might go through in creating these sort of isometric images. Um, in fact, uh, my usual process um, uses very little Illustrator when I'm making diagrams and is more of a Photoshop and sort of Rhino process typically, often also using uh, rendering engine, which we're not covering today. Um, but you will want to, again, discuss with your studio faculty on topics that you could be potentially diagramming. Um, if these are different than what you'll be doing in studio, then feel free to diagram any topic you are interested in, even if it's silly. Uh, again, I don't really care terribly much about what the analytical content is here. I'm really just wanting you guys to explore the tools. But if you are going to end up turning this into studio, you want to make sure that it's appropriate for that as well. So again, just have that discussion. Um, each studio faculty may end up doing this slightly differently. Um, so a diagram, in essence, is a visual communication tool. And it's one that we use repeatedly in design, architecture, interiors, um, all forms of design, really. Um, the way I like to think of it is the process of removing excess information to get down to the point that you're trying to make and letting that point speak as loudly as possible to tell whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, the diagram on the screen right now maybe doesn't do that exactly. It's something a little bit different. It was meant to be somewhat abstract. And I'll go over that diagram and how I created it and the sort of process for it. Um, so in general, I've listed several topics below that you could potentially investigate. Um, all of these could be fine. Um, you can come up with your own. These are just a starting point. Um, there are certainly plenty of things that you can probably investigate. I think a good general strategy, though, is 
since you're going to be diagramming your own work in this instance, what was it that drove your design? What was it that you really valued? And what was it that you wanted to really sell as part of your design? And that's what I think the diagram should most um, closely try to resemble in some form. Um, that's why I think where diagrams can be most important. Um, they can also describe you know, the minutia of any design, but I think getting at what is the sort of generative concept um, that drove your design is the one thing you could point to and say, I did this. Um, that's what diagrams tend to be really good for, in my opinion. Uh, so this will be due uh, next Tuesday. I forgive the, uh, I will fix that. It does not need to say Thursday. Uh, next Tuesday, November 3rd, which happens to also be election day. So make sure you, if you haven't yet, go out and go vote. All right. So I'm going to go through a couple examples um, that I have up. And I'm not going to start with this one, but I'm actually going to start an illustrator. So as I said, you can use both Illustrator and Photoshop for this assignment. I do want you to do the majority of the work in Illustrator or at least start your process in Illustrator, adjusting vector line work um, however you see fit. So this uh, I happen to bring up because uh, it's a diagram I did a while back that happens to be looking at, um, well, the same area that we're currently investigating in Studio. Uh, so what you see here is a basic figure ground reversal where uh, on the left image, we see the actual buildings, the roads um, that are within the sort of Finley Market neighborhood. On the right, you see these sort of red odd shapes, and this is just the leftover space between buildings in each one of the blocks. So we could zoom into what is our site that we're using this semester right here, and we can see that block is actually this sort of tied together net or web of sort of integrated space that you could theoretically walk between um, and all still be sort of in open, or not necessarily public space, but open space, um, all within the sort of general same block. So each one of these is a little different. Some of these, some of this is parking, some of this is uh, roads or access roads or alleys or other things or yards, uh, it varies. Um, the idea behind this diagram is more that perceptively as you're moving through these spaces, you don't really perceive the sort of boundaries of property lines um, outside of maybe, you know, if someone has a fence up or something. You, if you see open space, it feels like a continuation of space. So that was what this diagram is really trying to show is what that sort of perceptive feeling of open space is regardless of property lines and boundaries and things like that. Um, so I'm actually going to go through a series of diagrams that uh, one of the GAs, uh, Brendan, had made. So I don't know these projects that he has, um, but he was able to give me some of his diagrams um, in an illustrator form, um, and I think they're all pretty great. So I'm just going to go through some of his layers just to see how he built these things. So starting from the very base, um, it looks like there was a series of imports taken from likely Rhino. Um, potentially what we see here with other things added on top where each of these layers is uh, broken out. So text is on its own layer. The red lines are on their own layer. Um, each element is really on its own layer as much as possible um, in order to keep organized. Um, we have something similar here. This is sort of a massing study um, on a large site. Um, and in this case, the use of the single color and an otherwise a grayscale image allows the project that we're looking at here to really stand out. And the fact that these volumes then have um, some lines on the side gives us an idea of sort of a relative general scale. We can understand that these might be four story tall volumes, just given that sort of extra bit of information. Um, there's also a pretty good use of line weights here. So we can see that there's a lighter line on the sort of topographic surfaces, uh, but the building that we really want to focus on gets a very heavy outline, really bringing our attention to that. Uh, same thing here, although this one has the addition of a cut through that has a, an arrow, uh, an isometric arrow that actually has a little bit of a cast shadow on it that helps it stand off from the page. Same thing here. Um, shadows can be an effective way to sort of make something appear separate from the image which can be a nice thing when you're trying to add annotation to an image. 
um, because it doesn't start to appear as being part of the architectural concept, it is clearly a distinct and separate thing as it is the only thing that has a shadow. So it's sitting above. Um, and that can be a useful thing to do from time to time. Uh, again, these are all images that Brendan had made. Um, he was willing to share. This um, image here is a really good use of patterns uh, in Illustrator. So if we zoom in, we can see there's lots of little dots and things happening. But all of that goes a long way to give a lot of life to this image. Um, we can also see, um, so this was pretty well modeled in the first place. So we get all the sort of layers of construction that are happening here uh, as part of this little structure. And then we get to also see it from the underside. Again, good use of line weights, um, good use of those textures, again, that really helps sell this image. Uh, next, we have a more or less kind of an exploded axon type of drawing. Uh, where we're getting, in this case, more of a hybrid, I'd say, um, not purely a, uh, a vector line work illustrator drawing, although there are certainly those layers, um, because we are getting some shadows down here that look like just sort of a standard shadow rendering or shadow export from Rhino or another software. But then on top of that, exploded upwards, we have different bits of information that we can start to overlay. Um, I think exploded diagrams are can be a very powerful soft or very powerful technique, but they also can be very challenging uh, to read. I think this diagram does a nice job because it's uh, very clear. Each layer is something distinctly different, and we can see how they lay on top of each other. I think where this diagram style becomes very challenging is when you explode so many complex things that you can no longer understand how it goes back together. Um, so that's always something I advise. If you're doing an exploded axon, make sure you can understand how the pieces fit together. In this case, because they're just sort of different layers of information, we don't really need to understand exactly how they fit together. And also just the fact that they're exploding upwards means we can kind of in our minds just imagine them coming back down. Uh, this is a very large diagram here that has um, some 3D model topographic information. Again, kind of a hybrid diagram as we're getting some vector uh, some raster shadows on top of our vector line work or behind our vector line work more realistically. Uh, all of the uh, topography lines that we see here. Uh, some sort of zoning that's coming out of a, a code analysis and then some buildings on top. Another explosion, our exploded uh, image. Again, everything here is broken down into layers, which is always going to be very useful. Um, Illustrator, Photoshop, um, and InDesign all use layers in a similar way where layers stack on top of one another. So anything on this layer can never be on top of anything on the layer above. Um, that is distinctly different from the way Rhino works where layers do not actually indicate a uh, stacked hierarchy. So again, another one of these sort of red images uh, with a single arrow indicating some sort of architectural move that's happening on this building. Uh, now we're getting into a series of images. So these are essentially the starts of images that I'm going to talk about in my demo. Um, just some exports of uh, a quick little um, carport study. And again, this is where we'll get to. Um, again, not a fully finished image, but a start of a potential graphic. Um, same thing. Again, I'll go over these when we do. Um, so in the past, we have used uh, people in images, uh, bringing them in through, say, cab blocks. Um, there are a lot of vector people that you can get, and these are definitely something I'd recommend having. So sometimes it's just convenient just to have one of these files open. So you can just take the person, take these people, bring them in, and put them into your scene. Um, of course, they're not exactly the scale. So uh, because we're not working with a scaled software, we'll have to adjust for that later on. Uh, but that's something we can come back to. Uh, next, so these are some other diagrams that are it's in a similar form um, in that these are isometric views. Uh, but the big difference here is that um, there is essentially no Illustrator line work done here. Um, this is all just sort of a rendering software and then an overlays and a uh, series of overlays in Photoshop. But I think the sort of technique, regardless of exactly how it's done, uh, creates a result that I think could be replicated in any software which is just kind of looking at a sort of series of operations, or in this case, these were a series of uh, studies on how you can move through 
a sort of generic urban environment. So each one of these uh, rows, or I should say columns here, was given some sort of term. And unfortunately, the terms are not in this particular image, so I can't say exactly what they were right now. But each one of these was sort of operating on those terms and exploring what that could mean. And again, sort of a very simple color palette here, uh, just white boxes, some trees, and then these sort of red objects moving through them, which were meant to represent movement uh, or paths or something along those lines. Um, in this case, again, they were sort of rendered with kind of a glass-like material, so you're starting to get some reflections and things happening in them. Uh, not at all necessary for this assignment, just sort of bringing it up just to see what other diagrams can look like. Uh, this is not a isometric view, but again, looking at uh, a site that is quite similar to what we're looking at. In fact, our site's right there. Um, and if you remember that diagram that had uh, the black and red uh, images or a uh, figure ground of space, uh, this is a continuation of that. And this would be the next slide that was presented where you can now see the red that was infilling between the buildings, but then also starting to categorize uh, specific buildings that we're interested in for this particular project. Um, so this case, I think teal meant buildings that had uh, existing historic facades that wanted to be preserved in, uh, in some way. And the orange texture or orange color, I think was something to do with um, roofs that were of particular interest at the time. Uh, but again, somewhat different style and using more of a render technique. Uh, finally, we have this guy, which is the cover image um, on this assignment. And what I like about this one in particular is just that it's a diagram, but it's also kind of a silly image, uh, which I think is actually its strength. It's really actually quite simple. Um, when you get down to it, it's just really a straight export with some very light shadows, um, pretty much straight from Rhino with, uh, actually this might have been rendered lightly, but either way, a pretty simple base image. Uh, on top of that, I just downloaded a picture of milk, <laughs> um, which worked very well because uh, this sort of milk splashing here um, is practically a black and white image. So when I set it to multiply, uh, it starts to almost appear on the background very nicely. And then I just had to create a layer mask, uh, which allowed it to be cut out so it fit behind the buildings. And then I just directly applied some red uh, as two different layers. One wasn't enough um, to make it be that sort of red liquid. And again, this was going along with the same image here, the idea of uh, pouring a liquid into a neighborhood, which then allowed it to fill up uh, and all the nooks and crannies would be filled by this red liquid in this case. Um, revealing the space that is left over between things. Um, so that's going to be it for the introduction. Um, I will cover in the demo uh, how to go from Illustrator, the sort of best practices. I'll be using this file. Uh, best practices on uh, Make 2D, how to get bring that into Illustrator. Uh, but also another thing to really consider is how much you do in Illustrator versus how much you do in Rhino is always going to be something that you can kind of determine. For example, here I have three different potential diagrams that I've actually modeled out. In this case, it just took a base model and sort of subtracted things away uh, until I got some sort of relationships that I found particularly interesting. Um, so here it's some programmatic volumes that were next to each other. Um, here is a relationship of an exterior screen wall to the circulation moving through it. Um, and here is just a sort of framing and structure that was going to be required for this project. Um, but all three of these would then be brought into Illustrator and then manipulated to create a series of images. So again, I'll go through that in the demo, but that's it for this one.